Father, we thank you again that we are here. We pray that you will be guiding us this morning by your spirit to hear afresh your word to us. Please help me speak what is true and what is from you and for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I wonder uh, if you had to try and imagine for a moment, I don't know if you ever do this, I certainly do sometimes, but try to imagine what will heaven actually be like? What will life in the new creation, the new heavens, new earth actually be like? What is it we'll be doing for 10,000 times 10,000 years? What will life be like in that day? Uh, I'm sure all sorts of weird and wonderful things probably go through your minds, how you plan on filling those days. I had someone talking to me this morning about whether it will work or not, and people want to think about that. Some of you imagine that it will just be like, I don't know, like last night for some of you, just watching uh, sport. As, as some people I talk to, especially if the team you like won, then you think that probably is heaven. Uh, others, uh, you have you have thoughts about time away on on. on out in the ocean, and, and verse 1 is going to have some really shocking things to say to you. Uh, we'll get to them in a moment. Others, you're thinking about those loved ones, and you're looking forward to spending time with them. And, 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 and I, I, I can't even pretend to try and offer all the different options people come up with. You know what goes through your mind right now. And so this morning, as we continue our series in the book of Revelation, the return of the king, I want to say to you, well done. We've made it through the hard stuff. We finally got there. Uh, 20 chapters where every week, those of you who are honest enough with me would say to me, you know what, I liked it, but I didn't really understand it, right? We've got through that. We finally got to the bit, which is really quite clear and simple. The bit that everyone likes, we get to hear this description of what life will be like with God. Uh, And so we're going to hear, we're going to spend the next couple of weeks just dwelling in this joyful place because of course we've spent so much time uh in in, in sort of thinking about issues that have been quite difficult i want us to spend a couple of weeks just enjoying hearing god speak to us about what life will be like and filling us with hope uh so this morning we're going to hear three things about what heaven will be like first of all that god will be there we're then going to hear that there'll be no more death mourning crying or pain those things will not be there And then we're going to hear about who actually will be there with God. And it's going to be those who have drunk the water of life. Uh, So let's get into it there. And as I said, verse 1 is going to shock a few of you and make a few tears appear in this room, I think, uh, unfortunately. Because John has this vision of a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. A lot of people speculate about whether that means complete destruction or renewal. You can chat to me about about that later if you want. The point is, there is some sort of renewal at least, and it's now in this perfected status. And then it says, for the the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse 2, that gets fleshed out more in the rest of chapter 1. We'll see that next week. But some of you are having panic attacks about verse 1, aren't you? There was no longer any sea. No fishing. No surfing. No boating. No, probably no beach, I presume that means. It's, that's panic worthy, isn't it? Uh, I've read many, many commentators try and explain it away because I think they also go through panic. Uh, look, you probably can explain it away. I think the point of that is not to say there'll be no fishing. I don't know if there will or not. I really don't. What it, but, but throughout Revelation, really throughout the Bible, the sea has been symbolic of chaos. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's where Leviathan comes out of. In, in, in Revelation, we heard about the beasts being created out of the sea. It's this place of, of chaos and uncertainty and and. And, and it's where, you know, the dead are, are, are waiting to come out from. And, of course, there's not going to be any more dead. So if the point is that aspect of creation shall be no more. Whether it literally means you won't get the fish, I can't answer that for you. I really can't. But the, the really simple answer I can give you is it'll be heaven. Like, if there isn't any fish, you're not going to miss it. You know, I, I think God's fairly in control of, of making things pretty good. Um, but anyway, just to answer that little panic-worthy moment that some folk have, I didn't answer it at all for you, really. But the point is, I want to get to verse 3, because that's 
the first real picture of what it'll be like. John has hears this loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Uh, we've said a few times as we've journeyed through the Bible, the basic story of the Bible is God's gracious actions to, re- to, to reverse the effects of human sin and establish a new creation. And now we're seeing what the new creation will finally look like when, when, when human sin has been fully reversed. And it's a picture of going back to the garden, back to the beginning, like is what we're going to hear these next few weeks. And one of the great features of the garden that we often forget is that God dwelled with his people. Uh, we're told in Genesis 3, it's, it's pretty much when things go downhill, that, that God is going through a, a wander through the garden in the cool of the day. And of course, Adam and Eve are hiding from him because, you know, they've done something they really shouldn't have. Um, and, and, and so initially there was meant to be this picture of God dwelling with humanity. But then we were banished. And the rest of the Old Testament, it, it, we see glimpses of it. We, we see various appearances of God. We see the, the, the glory in the, in the cloud and in the Exodus story. We see God dwelling amongst his people in the tabernacle and then in the temple. It, 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 but there's separation still, isn't there? He's not, he's not really dwelling amongst his people. There, there, there's the curtain that separates them. And no one can actually access God, not actually be with him. He's certainly not wandering around with his people experiencing the fullness of life like that that was meant to be. We then get this, this taste of what things could be like, of course, in Emmanuel, as we might be thinking about these next few months, in God with us, in the incarnation of God the Son, in Jesus entering our world. We see examples of that, because, of course, when Jesus encounters sickness, sickness disappears. When Jesus encounters various forms of evil spirits, evil disappears. That's what life is meant to be like when God is dwelling amongst his people. And now, yes, for us, we have God dwelling in us. We have God, uh, the Holy Spirit within us. And we benefit from that, of course, that the Spirit is transforming us. It comforts us. It it counsels us. It it helps us, you know, pray. It it groans and intercedes when we can't. It helps us connect with God. But it's still not the full experience of what is to come. It's a little bit like, for those of you, who in 2020 have had to experience this this sort of not quite full relationship with loved ones. Uh, Those of you who have loved ones, you know, mums and dads, brothers and sisters, children or close friends who are unfortunately not on this island, who are over a sea or over many seas, it doesn't really matter, we haven't been able to see them. I'm assuming many of us, I've talked to you, so many of you have experienced this, and it's been painful this year, not having that full relational connection. But living in 2020, there's been some of some, some good things, hasn't there? Because we live in this age where we have technology like FaceTime and, and, and Zoom and all these things where you, you at least can still not just talk on the phone, but you can, you can see them. You can actually have a conversation that is almost in person, in fact, my family, we play online games and, and Naomi's always playing games with her cousins uh, on the internet and, and, and that's pretty good. But even Naomi gets that it's not the full experience. Uh, God willing, as the borders open up, one of her cousins who's in um, South Australia is going to come down uh, next month. And, and Naomi's like, I'm finally going to actually get to see Isabel in person and get to play with her in person and turn off alarms in person with her. (laughs) And she can't wait for that in-person experience because there's something far more special about that. And that's the picture that we've been painted here is that yes, at the moment we... We we can experience God, we have his spirit within us, we we have all these wonderful benefits, but it's not actually having God dwell with us, God walking amongst us, God being with us. It will be wonderful. And so friends, in the here and now, when you find yourself struggling, you find yourself distant from God, when when it feels difficult, know that a time is coming when that will be the most foreign feeling you can imagine. When you will see him face to face, when we will be with him 
for eternity. It will be wonderful. It will be glorious. It is the absolute core thing that makes heaven heaven, is that God will be there with us, his people. That's the first thing uh, that we're seeing this morning. And the second is, is one of the, then the implications of God being there in this renewed creation is that everything that's wrong in the here and now will be no more. There'll be no more death, mourning, crying, and pain. Uh, the next thing uh, that is said, I think, is one of the most like, intimate verses in the whole of the scriptures, one of the most cherished and, and beautiful images. In fact, it's, it's hard to think of an image anywhere that is more special than this. It says that God will wipe every tear from there, from our eyes. There are a few more intimate human actions that we can do than wipe away someone's tears, to be able to get close enough to someone, for that person to trust you enough, to allow you to to put your hand on their face and wipe away their sorrow. It's saying that's what God will do for us. He will presumably bend down, I don't know, and wipe the tears from our eyes. Like a father who who sees their child in pain and sickness and upset about whatever it might be and all they want to do is wipe the sorrow and the tears away. That's how God feels right now when he sees the sorrow we go through and now they're knowing there's a time where he will actually remove those tears. It is a beautiful image. I hate to say the next bit because it's almost going to ruin it. But I don't think it's really going to happen. You say, I don't think it's really going to happen because I think it's meant to be a metaphor to describe what life really will be like. Because God's not going to bend down and and wipe away your tears in the new creation because there will be no more tears. Because the, the experience that we're going to have is that there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For all the, the old order of things, all the things that, that burden us now will pass away. You just have to take a moment just to let that soak in. I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know that life is hard. We all have people who we wish were in this room this morning, but they are no longer with us. We wish that we could actually have a FaceTime with them even. But we can't even do that anymore. But that will not be the experience of anyone in the new creation because there will be no more death. That song we sung, where our death is your victory, where our death is your sting, we can say that because it will be gone. (coughs) No more of the mourning that is attached to it that can last for days and weeks and months and years and for whole lifetimes as we mourn the loss of people that we really care about. And crying, as I said before, there's no more crying, therefore there's no more wiping tears away. I don't know, those of you who have tears of joy, I guess you probably will still experience that. Um, I've never been someone who cries because I'm happy, but I know some of you do. I, 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 I imagine that, that you might still be able to do that. But there'll be no crying about sadness anymore because there'll be nothing to be sad about. All those things that just weigh us down right now, all the pain that we go through, whether it be the the relatively trivial pain. I know, you know, this past week or so, my household, we've been feeling our our mortality, I guess you could say. Uh, You know, Naomi's had this little infection that she's missed. She only went to school on Monday. Uh, Lynn keeps just hurting herself in weird and wonderful ways. She just keeps banging into things and just somehow hurting yourself. Uh, and of course, I had to admit to my, you know, oldness the other week, didn't I, with my, my back that I managed to somehow hurt and couldn't get out of bed, as embarrassing as that was. You know, and, and they're all fairly trivial, but you, some of you, you know pain in the physical sense. You know that your bodies are broken. Some of you, your, your eyes really don't work that well anymore. You can't see what you once saw. 
You can't hear the things you once heard. You, you miss out on the, on the beauty of sound and the beauty of sight. And, and, and for others, you, you live in constant pain. No one else knows this, but your, your body is just apes. Day in, day out, you are broken. And, and it's just, there is no more of that. And of course, pain, as we all know, is not a physical, just a physical thing. There are so many things in life that just cause us grief and cause us agony and cause us sadness. And those things are gone. It, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Some of you are, are so familiar with the Psalms, that the Psalms lament speak to you. you. You find yourself constantly crying, how long, O oh Lord? You find yourself saying, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? You, you know the battles of, of mental illness, and, and Christians aren't immune from this, as we should know. But that will be no more. There will be complete clarity of mind, physical perfection in our body. It, it will be wonderful. I cannot possibly do justice to this, as I'm sure you're noticing. And so I want to say, friends, when in the here and now, when you go through the experiences that we go through, death is still sad. And yes, we still miss people. But a day is coming when we will be with them again in glory and when death shall be no more. And so we take hope and we take comfort from that. There are many, many good reasons. I guess they're all bad. You know what I mean. Reasons why we cry now. But a day is coming when we'll cry no more. There are so many things that cause us hurt, that cause us pain. I want to say, friends, look to head to that day when that shall be no more where our Father who dwells amongst us will have wiped every tear away because he has made all things new, that he has removed all that is wrong and we get to enter into his glory and it will be absolutely marvellous. Continually preach that to yourself each day as you struggle through the various things that life throws at us. That is the second thing that we've seen this morning. But the third, of course, the catch that we all want to know is, well, how do we end up there? <laughs> how do we enjoy this place where God dwells amongst us? How do we enjoy this place where death and mourning and crying and pain are just not a thing anymore? I want to say it's those who have drunk the water of life will be there. We'll read first from verse 7 and 8. Because verse 7 and 8 basically categorise the world again, as we've heard a few times in this book, into these two camps. Verse 7, it says, Those who are victorious, they will inherit all this. All this wonderful <coughs> image that we've talked about so far, we're going to hear about more in the next couple of weeks. And God, he will be our God, and we will be his children. We'll get to call God our Father. Now, victorious is a word we've actually encountered many times in this book, haven't we? The, the, the seven letters to the seven churches all finished with, so the one who is victorious, I give you this promise of something to do with eternal life. But victory in, in Revelation, victory in the Bible looks very different to victory in our world. It's not about being the, the one who seems to come out with power, the one who, who looks popular. It's, it's, it's not these things. Sometimes victory is death, as in death because someone has killed you because of your faith in Christ. Sometimes victory is, is having to say no to, to, to sin and, and, and being mocked and being excluded. It might be being in the minority in various points. Sometimes victory doesn't look how like we normally talk about it, but it is wonderful victory to experience this. And so there's the camp of those who have persevered. Because victory really is about trusting in Christ and persevering in Christ and continuing to trust him even when all those things that cause life to be so hard happen. And then there's the other camp. And, and, and I'm so tempted just to leave this verse out because, you know, most of us, all we think about is the positive in Revelation 21 and 22, but there are these, these reminders because they are meant to comfort and warn God's people. Because the other camp is the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral... And those who practice the magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the second death and to the rather warm lake. Now, I know we're sick of saying of, of, of that bit, but, but, but we're meant to hear both. These were words of comfort, because these are words written to real 
people in a real time and real place, and they were being tested. They had people infiltrating their churches, deceiving them, and saying, it's all right. You can, you can still live the way of everyone else in society. You can be as, as, as sexually moral as anyone else, and that's fine. God's okay with that. Or, or whatever it might have been they were, they were teaching them. Or, of course, some of them were being murdered for their faith in Christ. They were being martyred because of it. And so they're hearing, that won't be anymore. And that is a word of comfort for these guys who are struggling. It also should be a word of comfort for all of us because you can't really enjoy a new creation where everything's new and everything's perfect and there's no death, mourning, crying or pain if those things are still going on. You can't really say there's no more death if there's people around trying to murder folk. You know, like just a really simple, simple example there. And all those things that break down relationship and break down community and cause hurt and pain won't be anymore. And so it's, it's meant to comfort and it's also meant to warn them, don't give in to these false teachers, don't give in to the, the values of the world you're in, don't keep flirting with society, don't, keep, don't think when the going gets tough, give in and embrace the values of the world. If that's not a good decision. It's meant to, to hit us in both ways. But I also think it's meant to hit us in this way that we realise, hang on, I could be in trouble in this list. So it's interesting, I think it starts with the cowardly and unbelieving and finishes with liars, because basically it's talking about people who were part of the church and gave up. And we realise, hang on, sometimes when life gets tough, I do want to give up on God. But sometimes I realise, hang on, I don't always stand up for Jesus. Sometimes I, 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 I you know, go a bit quiet when those controversial issues come up and someone's looking for the, the God opinion on it. And when I think about murder, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming we haven't got anyone who's murdered anyone in the room this morning. I said that at Stanley. They all laughed. You guys are just silent. So I'm a little concerned about that. But then when Jesus talks about if you hate someone that's like murder, I think, oh, that could be a trouble. And a sexually immoral, you know, it doesn't matter how you define that, because how does the Lord Jesus, he says, if anyone lusts after someone, they've, they've committed adultery with them, you think, oh, oh that's standard, I'm going to be in trouble. And I've certainly lied, and I've certainly, you know, we're in trouble here. And that's where we remember again why it is we actually get to enter into this new creation. It's because of what Christ has done. And it's by accepting his offer of the water of life. In verse 6, Lord Jesus, he says to John, it is done. It's the third time, really, he says that. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. He says, it is done or it is finished on the cross to say, I have paid for your sins and I have paid for the times where you have failed to leave my way. He says, it is done a few chapters ago when it came to judgment that he has finished that. And now it is done. I've established the new creation. We are now in this lifetime of perfection, is what he's saying. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the A to Z. I'm the beginning and the end. And he says, to the one who is thirsty, I will give them water without cost from the spring, the water of life. To the one who thirsts after him, to the one who realises, hang on, by my own goodness, by my own deeds, by my own works, I'm not entering this new creation. The one who realises that they have nothing to offer, he offers the free gift without cost of the water of life. I wonder if any of you have ever thirst, thirsted before? Thirst? I'm going to debate that in my mind later. But I wonder if you've ever felt really thirsty before, like really thirsty, like I can't live if I don't have a drink thirst. It is a horrible feeling. It's one that, by the grace of God, we pretty much never experience in our society uh, I had a really minor form of this once, about 12 or 13 years ago. I was at this uh, mission conference in Malaysia. Uh, and anyway, there were, there were Christians from all over the world there, and, and, and there were a few issues for me. One is that um, I'm, I'm okay at eating now, but I was a really fussy eater uh, prior to about five or ten years ago, like super fussy eater. And, of course, the conference in Malaysia had food that I didn't really want to eat, so I already wasn't eating much. Uh, and, and then, if you know anything about Malaysia, you'd never have to check the weather temperature. It is permanently a billion degrees, right? And so, give or take, give or take. 
and, and so uh, there were people from all over the world there, and there's some free time. We were like, oh, let's let you know, let's do something. And so this game of, of the beautiful game of, of football came up. Not of course what they played last night. What they're, not, what they're going to play tonight. But of course, the round ball version, soccer, if you will. And so in this game of soccer on the beach, if you've ever played sport on the beach, you know how tiring that is. And also me, I'm far from an athlete right now, but I really wasn't 12 or 13 years ago. I was very unfit. Uh, and, and, the, and the long story short is by the end of that, I was in trouble. And I realised I am seriously punched. And, and I started, I was covered in sweat, and I started getting delirious wandering around this campsite, and eventually the sun had gone down, everything had closed up. I don't know where everyone else went, but I, it was like I was alone, even though there were probably hundreds of other people there. I, I remember going to the, the, the bathroom, I don't need to describe the details, it was very evident, but I was seriously dehydrated. I realised that my wallet was useless because there were, I didn't know, A, where any shops were, and B, I didn't have any of their currency uh, at the time anyway, because I didn't think I would ever need it at this, this conference where everything was provided. And I suddenly realised, I, 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 was, I was barely able to stand up. I was so whatever. And I'm stumbling around this campsite and I found outside this building a crate. And in the crate was this one of those big bottles of water because, of course, I couldn't drink just the tap water there. But there's this one of those big bottles of water with the lid on the still. I was like, oh, yes! Oh! I probably had hours of dehydration, let alone, let alone compared to what some folks suffer. But it, it is this feeling of absolutely being helpless and needing this, this life-giving water to survive. And that's what we're meant to cry out for. We're meant to come to Jesus and to, to receive this life-giving water without cost from him. And it's interesting because he talks about this elsewhere, doesn't he, in his, in his first coming. This life-giving water. And it reminds us especially of how this water is on offer for anyone. So I think sometimes when we go to church, we think we don't need it. And it's a reminder to us, stop trying to think you are good enough and come to Jesus and receive this water. But then I also want to suggest there are sometimes people who think there's no way that I could receive this water. That, that I could ever be good enough for God. That he could ever accept me. And so there's this, this beautiful scene in Jesus' time on earth where he's in this village in, 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 in Samaria. Now, Samaria, as many of you probably know, they were the enemies of the Jews at the time. They hated each other. So he's in the wrong place, and the people there are the wrong people. And he's by a well, and a woman comes up to him. And in that society, you didn't speak. Men and women didn't speak. They didn't know each other. And you especially didn't speak to this woman. Uh, as the scene goes on with Jesus and this woman, he, he, he kind of shows who he really is to her because he says, well, go and, go, and, go and speak to your husband about what's going on. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus is like, I know. You've had four. And the bloke you're shacked up with now, you're not married to. She was overtly seen as this immoral woman. She was of the wrong people. She was the wrong gender in that setting. And she was certainly of the wrong lifestyle. And yet, what does Jesus say to her? Ask of me for a drink, and I will give you living water. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, this water of the well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so I want to say, friends, and I want to say this is the message for you to share as well with people, is that some folk think there is no chance that God could ever love them, that God could ever accept them. Some of you, you might have people who think there's not a chance in the world you would even be in this building right now, or maybe you're watching online because you know, some of your loved ones are here, and you think there's no chance that, that, that God could accept them. Well, the message of the gospel is that God does love us. And he wants us to ask of him for this water without cost that will spring into eternal life. And so, friends, the question for us today is if we want to enjoy this wonderful new creation we're talking about, this place where God will dwell amongst us, where we'll get to see God face to face, 
And the answer is come to Jesus and receive this water of life. If you want to experience the place where there's no more death, mourning, crying or pain, then come to Jesus and experience the water of life. If you want to receive this glorious new creation where you can call God your Father, then come to Jesus and ask of him and he will give you living water and will well up in your soul into eternal life. Let's pray and give thanks to our wonderful God. Lord God, we give you thanks and we give you praise that you are wonderful, that you are our Father and we long for the day when we will be with you in your presence and we will experience life in abundance with you. When there will be no more death, mourning or crying or pain, we pray that you will fill us with this hope each day. We pray in thanks that we just need to ask of you and you will give us this drink of the water of life. We pray that we will share this message with our friends, with our families, with our loved ones who need to come to you and find life in your son forevermore.